All right, good evening and welcome to our participants for this special presentation with Leila Hassan Howe in conversation about Black British civil rights and the Black power movement in this country. Um, we're from, oh sorry, I'm from Black History Walks. We organize walks, talks, and films uh, on Black history each month of the year, all year long for the last 15 years. And on the screen in front of you, you can see some of our coming events. So we have some coming events. You can see them listed there. And if you want more information, just go to our website, which is blackhistorywatch.co.uk and check out those events that are coming up shortly. As far as today is concerned, let me go forward. All right, so this session is being recorded for posterity and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel um, in about a couple of days or so. Let me go back there. So yeah, this will this session is being recorded and it'll be online in about maybe three to four days on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Black History Walks. It's youtube.com slash Black History Walks. As far as questions are concerned, we're not taking any questions while the speaker is talking. We'll take questions after the speaker's finished talking uh, and we'll take questions for maybe like 15 20 minutes or so so we're not taking questions during the presentation you can speak to each other within the chat function um, and we'll take questions using the chat function after the speaker has finished talking so if you ask a question during the talk it's going to be ignored um, and this presentation is brought to you in association with the Sarah Parker Mon Centre which is part of UCL in central London now, you might not have heard about the Sarah Parker Mon Center before, but they've been around for a couple of years now, and they came out of student protests. They came out of protests, they came out of protests at UCL about the lack of diversity amongst the staff and curriculum and also some of the history at that particular venue. And now they exist, as it says there, to study racism and racialization. So they have a number of really interesting um, events and also resources which you can access for free online, as you can see on their website, and also in this particular slide here. So they do events all year long as well, looking at a number of different permutations when it comes to when it comes to race and racialization. Okay, this seems to be skipping for some reason. All right, so Black History Walks runs walks, talks, and films on the Black History in London every single month of the year for the last 15 years. Now, excuse me one second. I have to fix a little problem here. So just give me a minute or so. I have to go and fix something. I'll come back in 20 seconds or so. All right, sorry about that. There was an error with the slide system. It was doing it automatically. I had to stop that. So now we're back on track. I got to this slide, and I was going to talk about how we have 12, 12 different walks across North, East, South, and West London, um, St. Paul's, Notting Hill, Brixton, etc. And basically, we take people on two hour guided walks and show them all the Black history, which is in the streets, the architecture, buildings, because there's lots of it there if you know what to look for, we do them all the time. Also, we have a Black East River cruise and the cruise goes from Embankment up to Vauxhall, down to Greenwich. And basically on that cruise, which lasts about three hours, we show people on the boat, the Black History on the Thames and on either side of Thames. And also we have characters in costume from history on board the boat telling their stories while we go up and down. The next one's gonna be March, 2022. We also show films at the BFI, which stands for the British Film Institute at South Bank. And these are some of the films we've shown before. And the films we show tend not to be shown by the mainstream cinema. So the posters you see in here, you probably never seen in your local Odeon or Cineworld or View, because for some weird reason, they don't show these kind of films. But these films are all about um, African Caribbean history. They're about heroes. They're about stories you don't normally hear about. And we show them plus a Q&A. 
Um, and we have a number of films coming up this weekend looking at Black British civil rights and indeed a certain person called Dark as Hell. So this is taking place this Friday, 5th November. Physical, it's a real event where, you know, I have to come at your house to get to this one. This is taking place at BFI South Bank on Friday evening um, in person. So we're going to show a very rare film featuring Dark as Hell from 1969. And in this film from 69, Dark as Hell is on TV challenging the Met Police about their behavior, about their racism in 69. This film is very, very rare. If you want to see it, you can come down to the BFI and we can have a conversation after the film is shown as well. So this is part of our kind of season looking at Dark as Hell. And we have the presentation today online. We have another one tomorrow online. And then we have um, two days of physical events at the BFI looking at Dark as Hell, his legacy and Black British civil rights. But today we're going to hear from Leila Hassan Howe, who's a legend in her own right. So in her own right, she was a Black power leader and still is to some extent. And she's going to take us through some of her story in this uh, hour and a little bit of, it, uh, of the time and tell us something about her life and what she was doing with regard to fighting against racism in this country. Oh, I forgot to mention, oh, I did mention this before actually. Um, this event is going to be recorded and when it's recorded, when it's uploaded, it'll be on this uh, channel. So that's the channel where you can see this talk when it's um, uploaded you'll be on this channel and also this is where we have some of our other talks that have been recorded over the last three four years or so so you can go to this channel here to see previous um online lectures from black history walks at this youtube.com slash black history walks website but for now we're going to hear from Leila hassan house let me just check Leila, are you there hi tony yes i'm here hi everybody Fantastic. All right. So basically, we're going to go through some pictures and you're going to tell us a bit about the pictures. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about the pictures. And that's basically it. So here's the first picture. Off you go. Lela. Tell us about this picture, please. OK, so this is me in Zanzibar. I was born in Britain in 1948 to a father who was from Zanzibar and came to the United Kingdom probably in the mid 1940s, 45, um, as a seaman but settled in East London and had the first halal book to shop in East London. Um, when I was around eight or nine, um, my father, um, my mother and father had separated, but my father told me that he was taking me back to Africa. Uh, my mother didn't believe this and said, there's no way your dad's going back to Africa. He's been saying this for years. Um, it's not going to happen, but he did. And I went to live in Zanzibar in Tanzania. And this photograph of me, I think is probably a year before I left and came back to Britain. And I'm wearing the traditional Kangas. Um, in Zanzibar, I was brought up in the Muslim faith, which I had been slightly in, in the United Kingdom. But this one isn't me in the normal part of that I was wearing as a young woman in Islam. This is me in, in the traditional African costume um, that uh, was worn by Africans at that time in Zanzibar with kangas really just wrapped around myself. So that's me. And you, did you say you were 19 in this picture? No, no, I was around 14. No, I was quite, no. I would have been 14, 13, 14 in this okay. photo. Yeah. Cool. All right. So this is a bit about George Jackson. It's a short video to talk about, well, to tell us about who George Jackson is, because there's a link between Mr. Jackson and Miss Hassan Howe. <laughs> George Jackson, aged 29, California Adult Authority inmate A63837, imprisoned January 12, 1960, offence second degree robbery. Convicted of stealing $72 from a petrol station, Jackson had a juvenile record. He was advised to plead guilty to get a lighter sentence. Sentence one year to life. Term served 11 years, seven months, seven years in solitary confinement. One to life means the convict is eligible for parole each year, subject to the judgment of a parole board. Jackson was refused parole eight times. January 1970, charged with the murder of a prison guard. Future if convicted, death row. 
With two fellow prisoners, Jackson allegedly killed a prison guard in reprisal for the shooting of other convicts. The three, George Jackson, Fleeta Drumgo and John Cliche, became known as the Soledad Brothers. August 21st, 1971, San Quentin. Three guards and two prisoners killed in an alleged escape attempt. George Jackson shot dead. Time seems to be passing much faster these last few months. Wonder where it's running to, what's building. Well, I'm positively displeased and I'm positively destined to remain so. Someone may have to get hurt, but power to the people, George. Fear, the emotion that stiffens and inhibits the mind of most men, causing them to be incapable of acting in their defense at the moment of trial, is totally lacking in me. I could look upon my total ruin with as detached and unconcerned as I look upon theirs. The payment for life is death. So that was a clip from a film we showed at the BFI several years ago, looking at the life and legacy of George Jackson. So that's just a brief little bit about Mr. George Jackson. But if you look at this image here, you can see it says, Sister Leila rendered salute to 1,500 marches at Grosvenor Square, where she led a deputation of five into the US Embassy to deliver an indictment against racialism in America. The march the embassy followed the rally to Trafalgar Square Commemorating the death of George Jackson. So, Leila, over to you, please. Okay. Um, so, George Jackson had um, written a book called Soledad Brother, which at this time, when I was in the Black Power movement, was one of the books that we all read. And so, George Jackson and the connection we felt with George Jackson was also almost a personal um, connection. And I can remember to this day the time I heard that they had killed George Jackson um, and how, you know, I jumped out of bed with my partner and we just screamed, oh no, oh no, because he was one of our heroes. George Jackson's also known because this is the case that makes Angela Davis famous because um, Angela and George Jackson had formed a relationship and Angela used to visit him in prison. And when his younger brother, Jonathan, tried to free him in court. Um, Angela was accused of trying to smuggle in guns to George Jackson, and of course went on the, F on the run and became the most wanted person by the FBI. But this delegation, I think you can see from my face, the kind of fury and passion that we felt, even though he was thousands and thousands of miles away from us, because in the black power movement at that time in the late 60s and 70s in Britain, we felt solidarity and a connection with what was going in the United States very deeply. And that has continued right through to what we see with Black Lives Matter today and George Floyd. Um, and so I led the delegation into the embassy and, and handed in a position, a petition, basically accusing them of racism and indicting the American government for what they had done to George. All right, so let me go back a bit because we first met you on this um, thing, at least um, when you were 14 in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. How old are you in this picture? And I what was the... 21. I would say I was 21 in this picture. Okay, and what was the journey, yes. journey, journey between being 14 in Tanzania and being 21 in the UK? What happened between okay. those two? So um, I had, my father had looked after many East Africans when they had come to Britain, primarily to study. And so when I went back to Africa, because I was, had already been brought up in the Muslim faith, a family that my father had assisted in Britain asked if I could go and live with them and they would bring me up in Islam as a, as a woman. 
and my father was single and so he agreed to that but this family was one of the wealthiest families on the island and they were Arabs and if I mean the history of Zanzibar is that um, it was a, a port for, for slavery um, and the the Arab ruling class there the Arabs there were part of the slave trading community but the Arabs were in charge really politically and economically but under the British so I'm a girl who grew up under British colonialism in Africa and have witnessed um, countries one by one fighting the British for their freedom and saw the end of colonialism in Kenya in, in Tanganyika as it then was but because the British handed over power to the ruling elite who were Arabs, the Africans had a revolution where they deposed the Arabs. And because I was living with a wealthy family, I had to get out of the country um, because at that stage they were murdering, they were killing, and th th there was a lot of kind of carnage of the Arab ruling class at that time. My mother is in England, in East London. She's a working class woman. She goes to the British Foreign Office and says, my daughter's British, she was born here. You need to get her out of this country. A revolution has just happened and her life is in danger. To which the British government said, no, we're not, she's not, as far as we're concerned, she's a Zanzibari, she came under her father and we're not going to consider her British. But if you pay for her fare, then we will guarantee her safety on the last plane that leaves Zanzibar. My mother was working in a sack factory and the whole of her family, her, her aunts and her sisters clubbed together and raised the money to take me out of Zanzibar and bring me back to the United wow. Kingdom. But the story around that really is that I was living with the Arab family when two armed guards came to the house where I was living and said that they wanted me to accompany them. And I believed that actually I was being taken away to, um, be shot or something was going to happen to me but they took me to the revolutionary council and when i got to the revolutionary council which was in a stadium they they said you know whose daughter she is and of course my father had been quite well known by all all um members of the society in zanzibar african asian and arab um, and so he was well respected and well liked and they handed me a telegram and they said can you explain what this is and it was my mum and she just put, get on the last plane, um, fare's been paid, you need to leave. And so, I, so then my father, they called my father and my father said, it's her mother and her mother's in England and wants her out. And so they told me I could leave. And so I got on the last plane at that time, very few people flew. I remember it was British Overseas Airways and flew back to uh, Heathrow where I was met by my mother who took me to live in East London. Wow. So I came back to Britain to a very hostile environment, which I've, I've talked about previously, in that it was the 60s. And we're now in the period, although Windrush is celebrated in 48, where the first people came over, in, six, in the 60s, you have mass immigration and you have mass immigration to places like East London. So I'm from Plasto in East London, um, near Stratford, and the hostility even of members of my own family to the immigrants who were coming in, who they believed were coming in to take their jobs and they were hostile on, in a racial way as well, was, was quite extreme. And so I, after reading a lot and because I felt very African, I was a Pan-Africanist. My father had um, talked to me about Africa and that, you know, and I understood the importance of Africa. So I left home um, and decided to join a Black Power organization. Right, Tony? Yeah, I'm here, I'm listening to you. Okay, okay. Up. Well, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I, I went to work for the Institute of Race Relations, and that's another story in itself. That's another huge story of how we took over the Institute ourselves and um, got rid of the council. But at the Institute of Race Relations, what we had was a huge library where we used to get the journals from all over the world, all the liberation journals. The journals from um, Black America at that time had something called Black Scholar. There was a Black intellectual tradition in America where we were reading. We definitely got the Black Panther newspaper. We got all the papers from the ANC. 
um, and the PAC as it was then, the Pan-African Congress in Southern Africa, all the liberation movements pa papers from Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, Angola. So we were well-versed, I was well-versed in understanding that there was an international black movement for change, not only in America, but worldwide. And so I kind of identified with that. I think what actually drew me to join a Black Panther, or a, a Black Power organization um, was when I saw Huey Newton from the Black Panthers standing on the bridge in Oakland, California, where the Black Panther Party in America was formed with a gun and was actually saying to police officers, confronting them and saying, you know, you are, you are not crossing here to come in our communities. That led me to believe that really we should be doing something in this country. But there were many people, many young people in Britain at that time who felt like me too. And I always say that I joined an organization called the Black Unity and Freedom Party by chance really, rather than choice. So there were many black power organizations at that time. There were the Panthers who were primarily based in Brixton and North London, the Black Liberation Front in West London. There were the Fasimbas in South East London. The, there was the Black Unity and Freedom Party. And I joined that because members of the Black Unity and Freedom Party would come to the Institute of Race Relations to talk and to read the journals from all over the world of the different liberation struggles. And they invited invited me to a meeting in New Cross and I went to the meeting in New Cross, heard what they were saying and so I joined the Black Unity and Freedom Party. Wow, so just, just to clarify, you're, you're basically living in kind of an upper class lifestyle in, in um, East Africa yeah, of an Arab really family. Like yeah. And uh, really, okay, and then you kind of get, well, kicked out or made a refugee because there's a coup there and your, your family here kind of rescues by raising the money that the working class uh, use their network to kind of bring you over here. And then you come to a working class East End background and grow up there and do a lot of reading to find out more about black history and black power. Is that right so far? Well, yes, more or less. But I mean, the reading is because I'm in an environment where there's a lot of hostility to the immigrants who are coming over from the West Indies, from the Caribbean and from Asia. And it was kind of from my sanity because I knew that all that was being said around me wasn't true. And that I knew in myself that, you know, the jokes that were being made about black people or, you know, trying to join in to be derogatory about, pe about black people at that time um, was something I couldn't really participate in. I left school at 16 I went to work at 16 because I just couldn't stand the racism at the school and I educated myself outside of um, going to university or to college I went part-time to West Ham College um, and left school just because of the racism and so there was a, a lot of conflict my family went to a working men's club where they did not allow black people into it and yet I'm there in that family um, having left Africa with a very African consciousness about what it is to be African and very proud to be African and and yet being in an environment which was quite hostile so I kind of motivated myself I read the Daily Telegraph which was a very right-wing newspaper but that was the only paper that carried news about what we call the third world about yeah. Africa about India about the Middle East they would that was the only paper where you could read anything in depth about these countries and of course, my, I always say to people, my savior was James Baldwin, because I've, it's Baldwin is the fire next time, go tell it on the mountain, another country, which absolutely convinces me that what is being said by official society and by the people I'm surrounded by, that black people um, were inferior, second class, um, was not true. And that, that was really the inspiration that led me, I think, to absolutely stand firm on the issue of race. And how did you get into this leadership position? Because it says you, you led the deputation to the, um, the square, and then you led the petition into inside the embassy itself. So how did you get at the age of 21 to be in this leadership position? So I think um, the people who organized the march, um, so when I joined BUFP, um, I must say I wasn't in the leadership of the Black Unity and Freedom Party at all. I think I might have been on the editorial board, but people felt that I could speak. So I actually was on a platform with Amoko Cabral, who some people may know as the big liberation uh, fighter for Guinea-Bissau. So I would speak on platforms um, because um, it was felt that one of my skills was that I was quite, you know, I was okay at public speaking. We all had different skills. There were editorial skills, there were organizational skills. So when we were having the um, 
the discussion about what we were going on the demonstration and the organization of the demonstration. I think it was just one of those things where at the time I was in one of the people who was going to hand in the petition. But me marching forward and holding my fist like that, that's absolutely instinct on the day. Nobody told me to do that. Nobody, um, you know, said that, you, you know, your leader in that sense. It was something I just did because I was driven and so angry at the murder of George Jackson. Okay, let's move on now. Okay, so what's happened here, Leila? And So this is now, um, during the early 70s, there was a lot of racist attacks against bookshops. So the Caribbean community, and I'm going to talk about the Caribbean community because that's basically, for, for part of my life, the, the community I've, I've had the connection with. Um, and bookshops like Bogle Overture, New Beacon bookshops, but there were also radical white bookshops who were beginning to sell the first black literature. And these were now being subject to racist attacks. And when I say racist attacks, I mean physical attacks. So Farouk Dondi, who I later worked with, he was in the Black Panther, um, lived above the Black Panther bookshop and a firebomb was thrown in there and Farouk had to jump from the first floor. Eric Huntley, who you see here, who was one of the proprietors of Bogle Overture bookshop, later to become the Walter Rodney bookshop, they would go, to their bookshop on a daily basis and find racist graffiti on it, windows smashed. So we formed a group called the Bookshop Joint Action Committee. And that's me with the placard around my neck. And basically we went to the home office because when we would tell the police about these racist attacks on the bookshops, they would more or less say, well, what do you expect us to do about it? What do you want us to do? Um, and, you know, you need to guard them yourselves, you know, you need to provide your own security. And we, we were very much of the view that no, that the, the police needed to take this seriously and needed to provide security for the bookshops. And so we, this is a march outside the Home Office where we're demanding action from the police and from the government to say that, um, that they need to deal with the, the, the level of racism and racist attacks that are happening to bookshops up and down the country. But this is in London. And in that photo, you can see Eric Huntley, who um, with Je his wife, Jessica, formed one of the first bookshops, Bogle Overture, later to become Walter Rodney. Next to me um, are two people I was in later in the race today collective with, Lorreen Burt and Jean Ambrose. And behind them, you can see someone called Ira. Ira was a member of the Black Panther movement. So what I'm, what I'm trying to show is that people from different groups and different organizations formed, formed together to uh, be part of the Bookshop Joint Action Committee to protest the level of racist attacks that were taking place at that time on bookshops throughout Britain. And this is what, 72, 74, something like that? Yeah, I would think it's 71, 72. Well, no, it's got to be later because Race Today starts in 73. Right. So this has to be 74, 75, because Jean and Lorene wouldn't be in the photograph. This is 73, 74. Okay. And are you wearing a black leather jacket? Is that what I'm seeing? There? Yes, I'm in, yeah, I'm in my black leather coat, yes. <laughs> I think it was black, yes, yes. All right, let's move on from that. What can, you, what can you tell us about this picture, please? So by now I've joined something called the Race Today Collective, and this is an organization formed by Darkus. Darkus forms the Race Today, begins to form the collective after he's appointed editor of Race Today. Race Today existed as a journal of the Institute of Race Relations. And um, the story around this is that Darkus is invited to be editor. Well, he's told he's on a short list for editorship of the journal because by now they believe that it's important to have a black editor of, the, of this journal. And Darkus tells people that he'll only be interviewed if he's assured of getting the job. <laughs> of course, he, he is interviewed and of course Darkus gets the job. The darkest decides that he needs to move into a black community. And so he, he moves to Brixton and begins to build this collective. And the story of, of our move to Brixton also involves somebody who's quite well known now, and that's Olive Morris. Because at that time, there was a, a large squatting movement in Brixton. 
calls mainly because the council had forced a lot of homeowners to sell their houses to them under something called a compulsory purchase order because they wanted to build a motorway. And so in those days, if the council or the government wanted to build a motorway, motorway and it involved knocking down your house, you would get an offer from the council and you would sell your house to the council unless you could get someone independently to sell it to. So there were a lot of empty houses in Brixton, a lot of empty houses and really beautiful, three floor townhouses, shop fronts. And when Darkus, who's in the Panthers or has um, uh, and a, a relationship with the Panthers. He wasn't in the Black Panthers in Britain for a long time, but Olive was also in the Panthers. And Olive says to Darkus, if you want to move, you should come to Brixton and you can get a squat. And so literally we went to Brixton with Olive's assistance and Olive would point out which were the empty houses that we could squat in. And we broke down the door of, of we went in the, those days, if you broke the door, we'll, change the lock on the door. So you kind of knocked out the existing lock, put your own lock on the door. The squatting law was that you could then live there and you could negotiate with the electricity and, and gas board and you could stay there as a squatter. So we did, first of all, Mail Road, which is the house Darkus and I ended up living in. And then we decided that for the magazine, we should have a shop front. So we went down to Shakespeare Road and changed the lock on the door of Shakespeare Road and squatted that building. And that became the offices of the journal. And then the lady next door to 74 told us, I'll be leaving soon. So I'll let you know when I'm leaving and you can squat this one. And so when she left, we broke down the interconnecting door and moved into her place and so race today had the corner unit of Shakespeare and Relton Road and that's where we produced the magazine from from 73 to 88 when the for, for the 74 sorry to 88. So part of this of, of race today was also we were a small publishing house mm. and so these two pa pamphlets you see here these two booklets are two of the, of the booklets that um that we produced. The first one, I have to say that what isn't known about Race Day Collective is that there were more women in the Race Day Collective than there were men. And Aqua was a member of the collective and she used to review a lot of the the, the art and the culture. And so we put all of the articles and the reviews that she did into this book called Brick Bats and Bouquets and published this Black Woman's Critique of Literature, Theatre and Film. The collective um, was a collective made up of Asians, West Indians, Africans, people born in Britain of Caribbean descent. And so uh, we did a lot of work with Asians in the Midlands. We were involved in the struggle of Asian women at Imperial typewriters in Leicester. And so we also catalogued the struggle of those workers and brought out another pamphlet. So we were a, an activist collective around a magazine called Race Today, but we were also a small publishing house and we published CLR James. Um, we, we published uh, other small, small publications. So can I just check, you said that um, a lot of houses were empty because they got CPOs from the council to build a motorway. Yes. What happened to the motorway? Well, that's, that's the point. The reason they were empty was because they then didn't have the money to build the motorway, but they'd already emptied the houses. So that's why the houses stood vacant and they were literally just standing there. And of course, Olive leads a movement of particularly young black men um, and women who, for whatever reasons, um, with their family relationships, then move into, these, into, these, into this squatting movement. Because the houses are just they're sitting there empty for empty ages. Empty for ages. ages, yeah. I mean, the, the house we spotted, the house Darkus and I ended up living in, um, um, I mean, in, in, and later on, after the uprising in Brixton, 81, the council then poured lots of money into the area. So we were given money to develop our house, our house um, by the council. So it's like a full circle. Um, but the, the, I had an owner and the owner came to visit us when we were in there. And he said to us, make me an offer, because after 81, um, he said, nobody's going to want to live in Brixton after what's just happened down here. This yeah. is 1981. Yeah. And this is a three floor terrace Victorian house. Yeah. And Darker says, we'll give you £6,000 for it. And he says, no, a bit more. And so they agree on 8,500. So the, a three floor house now in Brixton, which is now worth nearly a million. And just after 81 was, we bought it for eight thousand five hundred pounds, right. and then the council gave us another ten thousand pounds in order to develop and do it up after eighty-one. Wow, amazing! 
Um, was race today also involved in the uh, virginity testing scandal with Asian people being tested for virginity at Heathrow? Was that something that you so were So that was, that was something around the immigration struggles. So we weren't directly involved, but we supported the, the campaign against that. Mm. Okay, cool. All right, so here's an edition of Race Today, looking at Brixton before the uprising. So tell us about this, please. So, okay, I think... Um, most people will know that in 81 there was a huge uprising in Brixton and this article which is written by Darkus wants to point out to people that the Brixton uprising did not happen because of Operation Swamp because by then we've got the media there now haven't we everybody's pouring into Brixton all sorts of news crews and it, it's all around the over policing of Operation Swamp this is what we're being told calls the uprising and what this article points out that the uprising has its history at least a decade or a decade and a half before when the police oppression in Brixton and we cite different cases and show how the Panthers in Brixton, particularly around the case of Joshua Francis, a black worker who was beaten up very badly by the police and other cases in Brixton, that this has its history, not in swamp, but in at least 15 to 10 years before. And it outlines all the different organizations like the West Indian Standing Conference, um, and, and other organizations who have been on about this question of police brutality in black communities, who have been on about the framing of the black community in black communities, and so, some really stark cases, which almost seem when they are not unbelievable because to an extent it's still happening. And so this once, which is what Race Day always wanted to do, was put things in a historical context that you never react to the immediate without looking at the history behind it. And this is what this article seeks to do. So this publication is like um, a magazine. It's like twenty pages, fifty pages. Yes. And also, how how are you how are you funding it? How are you getting the money to actually publish this? And where so you right, so one by sales, I have to say. So as a collective, um, we uh, have to say no. That's not correct, Quacko. It was seventy four Shakespeare and one six five Milton Road, but that's not. I did say questions at the end. Questions okay. at the end. Okay. All right. So no. So race today. So the story of race today is this. When we leave the Institute of Race Relations, we have no idea about money. We just know that we need to be based in the black community. And Darkus, inspired by his great uncle CLR James, says he's gonna build a collective around a journal. So we never wanted to be a large organization with hundreds of people. It was to get a small group of people, but we would publish a journal that would be a vehicle and would also uh, support what was going on in the black communities. So when we moved to Brixton, we were, at that time, there was something called liberation theology. And liberation theology was a movement by the churches, it, particularly in South America, but also in Southern Africa, to say that the liberation struggles that were going on in these, in these societies were valid struggles and that the church, if it was to really stand true to its principles of Christianity, had to support these struggles for freedom. And so we were looked on, the Race Today Collective was looked on as a liberation movement in Britain. So we were visited by people from the World Council of Churches. And again, it's almost bizarre to talk about this, but they actually came and slept in the squat. They wanted to, to understand what, what we were on about. What was our fight for liberation in, Brit in Britain? What did we want to do? What was it like? So they, so they came, a couple of them came, a couple of Methodists came, but they didn't just come and you had to talk. They came and they lived with you. They wanted to understand what it, the, the very essence of what your fight and your struggle was for. And when they did that, they went back to Geneva, which is where the World Council of Churches were based, and said that they believed that the Race Today Collective was equal to a liberation movement in Southern Africa or in South America, and therefore the churches ought to fund us. And that's how Race Today was first funded, by, by the church movement, by the World Council of Churches, by the Methodists. Um, it was a very radical Methodist. I'm going to show my age now. Somebody called Colin Morris, Trevor Hudson. These were priests who'd been in Southern Africa primarily and had been in the anti-apartheid struggle. And so when they saw that what was going on in Britain and there were a group of young black people there were, who wanted to fight for, for freedom and for equality in Britain, they had no hesitation in saying that we should get 
funding. So that's the initial funding of Raise Today. It then changes when Ken Livingston takes over the GLC, uh, uh, but the whole political climate in Britain changes in the late 70s and 80s. But the initial funding was from the churches, the World Council of Churches. And, and you're, you're selling this publication. Where are you selling it? How do people get to buy it? So Race Today, so the important thing about Race Today is that no Race Today was established as a journal anyway by mm. the Institute of Race Relations. So we're not starting from scratch. Right. So every university in Britain is taking Race Today even before we take it over. Uh, um, it's in institutions, it's in libraries, all the government departments are taking Race Today because Race Today was kind of part of the establishment. It's when Darkus takes it over and radicalizes it that, that some of those people who initially took race today didn't, but many of them did because they were curious and they were interested to know, well, there's a shift in now. This is coming from black people. It's not white people talking about black people. It's black people talking about themselves and what they want to do for themselves. It's black people organizing for themselves. So many of those institutions still took the journal. So it already had an established readership even before we radicalized it right but so we're getting income that way as well okay great here's another uh, edition set 75 right idle threat against race today what's that about so um if i remember rightly darkus has made a oh this is around eastenders and squatting which i think we're going to come to later so i'll talk in in um in more detail then but basically, um, there was a, um, in East London, there were corrupt Bangladeshi businessmen and councillors even who were selling squats to the Bengali community. And they were actually paying to live in properties that in fact were empty, a bit like the Brixton situation, empty, very poor conditioned uh, properties. But in order just to get some kind of housing for themselves, they were actually paying to live in squats. And so Race Today published this and we named one of the people who we said was uh, selling squats. And he said he was gonna uh, have take out, well, he did take out a libel threat against us to say that what we said wasn't true. But this cover, of course, is around the big, big demonstrations that were happening in Britain at that time around immigration, because they, after 60s, in the late 60s, they changed the immigration policy to say that even though before you could come in and bring your children and bring your wives, that now they're saying this is the beginnings of what then ends up in Windrush of saying you can come and work, but you can't bring your mother here, you can't bring your wife here, you can't bring your children here. So this is what we were fighting against the policy which said you can come and work, but you can't bring your families. Right. And the race today editions, are they all kept in archive somewhere? Can people actually read them from you know? Yes, so yes, so there's so the this is interesting because the Black Cultural Archive have copies of Race Today. And I, I know this because we were there two weeks ago looking at them because we're about to digitize Race Today. Oh. And luckily for us, we're going to do it with Columbia University in the United States. Wow. And that's because Columbia hold Darkus's archive. What? Um, oh, hey. there, there How is did a, that happen? Because there's somebody called Bobby Hill who was a very fame, uh, who wrote the very famous text on Marcus Garvey. I think the seminal work on Garvey was written by an academic, a radical Jamaican academic called Bobby Hill. And Bobby Hill was able to get CLR James's archive and persuaded Columbia to house CLR James's archive. And because of Darkus's connection with CLR, he visited Darkus when he was alive. Um, with somebody from Columbia University who said that they would like to house Darkus's archives next to CLR James's archive because they saw Darkus's work as a direct offshoot of CLR James's politics. Now in America, unlike in Britain, CLR James is in many, many of the universities and academic institutions. CLR is red. CLR mm. is considered a very, very serious historian, particularly for his work on Haiti. And mm. so they asked Arcus if we if they could, uh, well, in fact, they bought his um, his archive while he was alive uh, to house it next to CLR James. And Columbia have recently been in touch with us to say that they want to digitize Darkus's archive and put it into context as well. So it won't just be the race to days that they have, but Darkus's life and work, the mangrove trial, um, 
all his work in Trinidad in the 1970s, where he was part of a revolutionary movement. And so luckily for us, they are going to digitize Race Today. So it will be available online probably in a year's time. That is but incredible. Right but right now, the George Padmore Institute, which is, of course, New Beacon Books, they have Race Today, and I think a lot of people go there to read it, the Black Cultural Archives, and of course, the British Library, the British Library has copies of Race Today. Mm. Well, that's amazing. Absolutely amazing. So this cover is, um, really shows race today's depth and range because you will see here that we have uh something on antigua we're mm. talking about the racist murders there was a lot of racial attacks particularly in east london in bradford in other areas um some against a lot against the pakistani and indian community but also against west indians in this country mm. Um, so we're talking about, you know, how people don't want to accept that there's, you, they want to wish away that there were no racist murders. We're looking at the radical movement in Antigua. At that time in the West Indies, there were lots of radical movements. There were the Rastas in Jamaica around a bang. There was Tim Hector in the Antiguan Caribbean Liberation Movement. There was in Dominica, there was a movement led by somebody called Rosie Douglas. So there's radical movements in the Caribbean. And Race Today is publishing this kind of international radical movement that's going on. As you can see, we've got Cricket by CLR James, um, of course, and it shows that our, the magazine, the, the cultural side, the fact that we've got news, that we're reviewing different books and, and art. Um, and then, of course, never forgetting Malcolm. And this is a wonderful article that looks at Malcolm X, who in 1985, of course, who's, who's now been dead for a while, but we're looking at his work and what he was saying about society. And we call him the last real social critic. And then black sections for the middle classes. This is around the fight to get black people accepted as MPs in the Labour Party. It's difficult to, rem to remember. But the Labour Party did not want black, black MPs at that time. And it's the four black MPs, of eight, Diane Abbott, Paul Boateng, Bernie Grant, and then Keith Vaz from the Asian from Leicester, who fight to be accepted within the Labour Party. But that was a huge struggle in its own right. And what Darkus is saying is that we now have a growing middle class or professional class, I would say, and that they have a right like every, to be as part of the meritocracy in Britain, that if they want to join the Labour Party, if they see the Labour Party as a place that they want to be, then they have every right to be there. But the struggle for that was huge in the Labour Party. I remember Diane herself would tell you when they first went up there, they were hissed, they were booed, um, they were not wanted in the Labour Party. And what has happened since in the Labour Party is another story. But that was one of the big struggles at that time was to get the right for black representation in the Labour Party. Let me go back a little bit, because this is this is from uh, 85. This is it, it printed in 85. Yeah. Yep. And this one was from 75. This is 10 years you're going strong. How are you supporting yourself over those 10 years? I mean, that's a that's a, a achievement all by itself to print a magazine. Well, no, it is. It is. And we went from 70, um, well, the first issue, Dark Sig, was November 73. And the last one we published was 88. Mm -hmm. And the reason I have to say we were able to sustain ourselves was because we were an organization that was based around ideas that we I always tell people, we, if you went to raise their offices from 10, 11 in the morning and we left at three the following morning, throughout that time, all we did was discuss politics, what was going on in society, what was happening internationally to black people. People were visiting us. We would get phone calls asking us to be involved in different campaigns. We would discuss who we'd support. The whole, there was a very big artistic and cultural movement um, and people asking us to publish and review. So we never stopped talking about what was happening to, to black people in Britain and what, we, what our role was within it. And that sustained us because it was a magazine. I mean, I don't like to use the word, but it was a magazine that had an ideology. Yeah. We knew why we were there. We knew what we wanted to do. We were radical. We were revolutionary. We were young. We had all that kind of confidence and ambition of being young. 
we had decided early on that we were not victims, that uh, the era, era in which we were living was from being victims to being protagonists. And so we were on the move. I mean, we were, we, we, we were going for it. As Darkus would say, you know, we were, we were hot, we were strong, we were, we were, we were, you know, we knew what we were doing. And, but we always discussed politics. We always discussed what we stood for and why we stood for it. And I think that's really what sustained us. And in that, we were lucky in that we had CLR James, who eventually came to live with us. We had the politics and the ideology of CLR, CLR James, and we had Darkus. And the, one of the other important things to say about race today is I had no formal education in university. And a large number members of the collective were working class people of working class children who at that stage, there was no big input into universities. So Ndarkas always used to make the distinction between educated and being an intellectual. And we always said that we were black intellectuals, uh, not necessarily educated, but we were intellectuals because we thought we read and we attempted to understood ourselves in a much wider context than just Britain or the Caribbean, but in the world. Right. So is it like mostly volunteer led or do are people? Oh no, so or? no. So again, something that couldn't happen now. I signed on at the labor exchange labor um labor exchange. I went and got my doll. So now I just know that this could not happen. So some of us we were unemployed. And you would go to the Labour Exchange, and again, Darkus' sister Carolyn worked in the Labour Exchange in Brixton, and you had to go every week to sign on and say that you'd look for a job, but you couldn't get one. Now, you have to remember at that time, it was not uncommon for black people not to have jobs. Mm. Um, so when you said you didn't have a job, nobody questioned that you didn't have a job. Um, and then you would go and get your doll money. And I think I probably got 25 to £30 pound a week. Um, so I lived off, off doll money. So we lived... We, we were in squats, so we didn't have rent. Um, we'd negotiated with the Gas and Electricity Board and it certainly wasn't the exorbitant money you pay for basic utilities that you do today. Mm. So um, we're living in race today offices. I mean, we're partying because at that time, as you know, some of you will know, there's a huge party movement in black communities, but it was house parties. Mm. So we're not paying to go to clubs. So three of us are signing on receiving dole money and living very simply. But as I say, our overheads were minimal. Um, then some of us have jobs and are coming into the collective in the evenings. So Farouk was a teacher. Uh, Pat worked in for the Citizens Advice Bureau. So it was a combination of the people who worked in the office, which was four of us, and we were signing on and getting dole money. I think Darkus was earning 30 pounds a week. I think we paid Darkus to be editor at 30 pounds a week. Um, and the rest of the collective were made up of people who had jobs, but came in the evenings and at weekends to support the collective. Wow, okay, great. CLR James, Man of the People. So you mentioned him and he's a real legend. Tell us a bit about him and his influence upon Race Today Collective and yourself even. Okay, so CLR, um, I mean, one of the honors of my life is to have known CLR personally, to have helped look, look after him in the later stages of his life when he came to live with the collective. He, he lived upstairs in the offices of Race Today. CLR was already a renowned historian and intellectual. I mean, his, the publications, his books, um, Black Jacobins, of course, being one of the most famous, but his book on Nkrumah, um, his books on Every Cook and Govern, on philosophy, his publications. So CLR is really well established, but he's also, Darkus's politics are inspired by CLR. And Darkus, even before Race Today, is always in contact with CLR and talks to CLR about, you know, what black people are doing, how black people can move. And the idea of a, an organization based around a journal, based around a magazine, actually comes from CLR James. And he says, what you need to do is have a vehicle where people who, who can talk about their everyday lives, what motivates them and why they want change. So we're living in a time in Britain where there is 
there has been huge movements for change in the world anyway. You have the movement of against the Vietnam War, which was huge. You have the women's movement, which is, is absolutely huge. And, and part of some of us women in race today joined the black women's group that Olive had said, but we used to go to women's liberation conferences. You've got the movement against, against colonialism, particularly Portuguese colonialism. And you've got the huge anti-apartheid struggle, as well as movements in the Caribbean and in India. So we're living in a period of, of a bit like I think now where there are huge movements for change throughout the world. And so the question is, we're, we're black people and we want to do something. And therefore we have this idea that we will publish a journal and we'll be a small organization around a journal. But at the same time, we will study, we will understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. And that we will support and assist other people also who are carrying out struggles. So we were clear that we weren't social workers we were clear that we weren't there to help people but we were there to help people develop what they were doing anyway and that kind of worked with us with John LaRose who had helped set up the black parents and the black students movement and race today we were all in alliance we had connections in the north of England with the Bradford Black Collective um, CLR was always very clear that when you're talking about black people in Britain, you're not talking about black people in London. Uh, so we traveled, the collective had, we would go to Leeds, to Manchester, to Liverpool, people would ask us to come, we would make connections. So you have to understand we're, we're a group of young people inspired really by the work of CLR. And Darkus would spend many hours talking to CLR. They had a disagreement over black people joining the police force. Darkus was against, CLR was for. And so they put that in the journal and had that debate in the journal. So we wanted to encourage people to think and to talk and to discuss their different ideas um, and to take things, things forward. But back to CLR. So the, the journal was inspired by his idea of a, of a paper that would be a vehicle and a voice for the, the Black and Asian communities in Britain. And so when um, I think Ken Livingston, again, in the Greater London Council, said that they were interested in in supporting the artistic movement we put on this huge exhibition at the Riverside Studios which was about CLR James and we invited speakers from all over the world we had a very famous Guyanese writer called Wilson Harris Tim Hector came um, and other speakers just to say that who CLR was and his influence on international black politics at that time okay amazing Walter Rodney, 1980. This yeah. is Conway Hall, Red Lion Square. Yeah. Uh, tell us a bit about this, please. So Walter Rodney, Walter Rodney used to come to race there. I mean, to see CLR, but um, to, to be part of race there. And I can see Walter sitting in the offices of race today at 74 Shakespeare Road, talking to Darkus about um, what was going on in Guyana. So Walter has published the seminal work for the Black Power Movement called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. There was no way you could be in a Black Power organization um, and not know who Walter Rodney was because what Walter did for us was show that before slavery, there was a developed African society and developed African communities. Um, which, of course, growing up in Britain and when people talk about slavery, it's if there were these stupid people who then got enslaved basically because they were stupid with no culture and then had to be shipped to America and the West Indies and then eventually come 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 to Britain as part of that whole empire legacy, um, but had no culture, nothing. And Walter's book, of course, shows us that that was not at all the case and how developed these societies are, but also shows economically through imperialism how Britain, and it's called how Europe underdeveloped Africa, has impeded Africa's progress because of the nature of um, the economic relations it has. So it was, Walter again was, you know, somebody who we all looked up to. And Walter went back to Guyana to, to try and make change in Guyana, to change society in Guyana, and he was murdered. And so this shows that we're having a meeting for him, uh, for people to remember who Walter Rodney was. I think even today, I think Eric Huntley with, with uh, the Walter Rodney Bookshop has a Walter Rodney Memorial Lecture. And this is our way of saying, we cannot forget those people who have contributed to our development. All right. 
And what's happening here in this picture? Well, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure why I'm looking like this because I kind of look like this is a bit boring, but this is the International Book Fair of Radical Black and Third World Books. I'm also observing my tights, which is just something for me in terms of <laughs> fashion tips, but we won't go down that route. Um, so we, with New Beacon and Vogel Overture, um, put on something called the International Book Fair of Radical Black and Third World Books, where we invite all the, in, all the publishers internationally to come and have a book fair. And part of the book fair um, is to have seminars and discussion. So as you can see from what I've said already, we're very much all the time pushing for us to talk about ourselves, to understand ourselves, to understand where we are in, in Britain and where we are in the world. Um, so one of the people sitting next to me is Lorna Goodison, I think who's a Jamaican poet, a very famous Jamaican poet, has been honoured in Jamaica. And I think the other person is an American professor called Professor Abdul Al Kalimat. That's just to give you a re an idea of the, in, of the kind of international flavour of what we were trying to do at that time um, in, in the book fair. So uh, aside from all these different publishers pu showing us their, their books and what they're publishing, we're also having a series of seminars and lectures and cultural events to talk about black people in the diaspora and where we are and what we're doing. Um, I just thought of something. You're, I know that a lot of black writers would have a hard time getting their leaflets or books published because most publishing companies were white and didn't, were interested. So how did you get Race Today published on a monthly basis? Okay, so there was something called the Russell Press. The Russell Press is named after a very famous peace campaigner called Bertrand Russell. Um, and he's somebody in, in British society who um, is, is well known for his stand for, on liberation and peace. And the Russell Press is a radical white press um, that when Race Today moves from the Institute, we come to an agreement that Russell Press will publish our journal. But we have to produce the journal ourselves. We are producing the journal manually. We are typing up pages. We are then proofreading the pages. And if we find an error, we're typing that line and we're sticking that line down with glue onto a page of the journal. Um, it's an absolute manual process. You're all too young to know anything about Letraset, but the headings are done manually in Letraset. It's only later when Kane Livingston gives us money for a more developed printing operation that we're able to have a bit of technology. But the early stages of Race Today, it's a complete manual pro process of pages that we're typing up, sticking down our own corrections, um, getting our own photographs, sticking the photographs in. Then we're bundling it up putting it on a train to Nottingham and Russell Press are then printing that journal for us and sending it back down to London. Uh, this time you're a journalist, editor, photographer, or are you doing everything or just one thing? So, yeah, so again, as I said, because I did not um, have any really formal education, um, there's somebody called Andrew Salky and coinciding with us, I think from Friday and Saturday, there's a, the University of London are having a conference just on Andrew Salky, who's a famous Caribbean writer. Mm. And myself and Lorene go to Andrew Salky and he assists us on how to write, how to become journalists. So the important thing about Race Today is that it's self-organization. We are doing all of this for ourselves. Darkus realizes that we do not have the skills to be journalists. I can't go to Leeds. Um, and know how to write up a story. And so Andrew Salky talks to me, trains me, makes me write, corrects my work. So I get trained as a journalist as part of my history and race today. We have other people who are educated, Barbara Bees, Marla, Farouk, they, they, they have had um, been to University of Farouk, been to Cambridge, of course, Marla to Leicester. So they have the ability to write articles. But for those of us who didn't, and this is the whole thing about developing working class intellectuals, we had to learn that skill ourselves as part of being a member of the Race Today Collective. So that's where I learned to write articles. So yes, I'm a journalist. I'm a proofreader. I'd never proofread in my life. I'm also an activist. So I'm going to meetings around people who've been beaten up by the police. I'm going to meetings, international meetings. I'm going to support strikers who are striking at a factory, say, in the north of things. So we're activists and we're also producing a journal ourselves. And it's a very fertile time for us. I mean, there's no doubt that this is the best time of our lives. We all, we all say this. 
very, very fertile time because because we developed ourselves. We had to develop in order to do what we wanted to do. And so we're, we're, we're in movement. We're moving. We're not static. And that's really important. OK, so what's happening here? Because you look a bit cheesed off. Oh, well, no, I thought I looked cheesed off in the other one. Um, so this is Abdul al Kalimat. This is Darkus, of course. This is me and this is Lorna Goodison. So I'm not sure what's actually happening. I think we're listening. Probably we're all listening to somebody speak. Um, that's how I um, I kind of look at that photograph, that we're, we're, we're all listening avidly to something that's being said. That's all I can, can think about. Okay. But we are also on the platform, so there's obviously another speaker. I see. National Poetry Tour with Nguts. How do you pronounce that? Ntozaki Shange. Okay. So Ntozaki Shange is the very famous uh, playwright who's produced in America for colored girls who have considered, considered suicide when the rainbow is not enough. Mm. So... Um, that's important because she's one of the first black American playwrights to get her work put on in mainstream theatre in America. Uh, but CLR James points out to us that Interjaka Shange is one of the most important um, women writers of that time. And he points to Toni Morrison, Alice Walker and Interzaka Shange. Shange is a poet, although she, she does write novels. And so Shange comes to the United Kingdom and we organize a tour with somebody who people may be more familiar with, Jean Binterbrees, who of course has passed this year, who is the, one of the first female dub poets brought to the United Kingdom by Linton um, around the whole movement of dub poetry. And so we, we, we take them and we tour them up and down the country um, to, to, for, for poetry, for poetry readings. And into Shange brings um, a violinist with her because she wants some of her poetry set to music. And so we went everywhere with uh, to Lees, to Bradford, to Manchester with these two poets and we called it Women of the World. And the, the big event was in Brixton in, the, in what now is the Ritzy Cinema, but was then called the Little Bit Ritzy. And we have a big event with both of them in Brixton where they both recite their poetry. I mean, this gives you an idea of the range and depth of race today. I have to say, when I speak now, I do wonder how we did all of this, but we did. Um, so, yes, so Shange is the, the film for Coloured Girls, uh, which was the, the stage play. But well, this must have been like um, like every single day, not just like... Oh, no, every day. Oh, no. This is, this is um, Sunday to Sunday. No, no there's no weekends. Yeah. There's, no, there's nothing like a weekend. No, no, not at all. And then, of course, because not everybody's working in the offices, you've got myself, Jean Ambrose, um, Darkus originally as the people in the offices. Um, Linton was a member of the Race Day Collective, Linton Crazy Johnson. You've got people coming in and out of the offices. So we're around when they come in in the evenings from work. That's why we're there till two and three in the morning, uh, Saturdays and Sundays. This is just full on commitment. This is what we did. Uh, doesn't doesn't there enter in it some sort of stress? Because if you're doing that every single day for like 15 years, there must have been some stress involved somewhere along the line. So I think because of the fact that you are about your own liberation. So we believe that, that particularly the way British society was, that what we were doing was in fact the opposite of stress. Hmm. This was absolute joy and we felt we were kind of, um, what can I say? It was a luxury that we were able not to have to go to work to do a nine to five job um, and have to be with some racist employer. That we were, because we felt we were actually our own agents, we had our own agency, stress didn't come into it. I'm not saying there weren't times when we felt a bit defeated, when we, um, you know, particularly with Darkus, who was arrested six times. We, there were a lot of court cases, a lot of, you know, anxiety around that. But when you really feel that you're shaping your own destiny, and we believe we were shaping our own destiny, it, it isn't stress, it's the opposite of stress. I had no employer, I had nobody to tell me what to do. I woke up in the morning and I determined what I would do in relation to the collective and the collective's work. So it's the opposite of stress. Wow, okay. All right, the road made to walk on Carnival Day, the battle right. for the West Indian Carnival in Britain. Yes. Over to you. 
Okay, so this, this is a pamphlet we produce around the struggle for carnival in Britain. So what people probably don't realize that when carnival first started, it was the police and somebody in particular called Commander Patterson who led the fight to stop carnival being on the streets. And the police actually went round to all the, neighbor, the, the local area in Notting Hill and got a petition the police were going into people's houses and asking the people who lived in that area to say they did not want carnival on the streets of Notting Hill. And they presented, the policeman himself, Commander Patterson, presented this long, long petition to the council to say, look, we've got all these signatures. They don't want carnival on the streets of Britain. So we're, we're having a fight to, to make sure that carnival stays on the streets of Britain against the police. That was one battle. The other battle we're having is that we are demanding of the Arts Council that they look on carnival as an art form that is of equal merit to say the opera or the National Theatre. So mm. we're picketing the Arts Council as well. We're going to the Arts Council and we're having pickets demanding that carnival be looked on as, a, as an artistic form from the black community that has as much significance or relevance as the opera does in Covent Garden or the National Theatre does. So we have carnival is one of the really big things that race today inv gets involved in with the local carnivalists. The other thing is that we also believe that we're not, because we don't do things for people, we then have our own carnival band and we join up with the mangrove with Frank Critchlow and the mangrove and we have something called Race Today Renegades Mangrove um, where we join up and we have our own carnival band. And um, we, in fact, the race today as part of Mangrove and, and Renegades, we then link up because of Darkus's connection with the carnival movement in Trinidad. We then have a lot of Trinidadians coming over and they form part of our carnival movement. So we won band of the year three times. We always have revolutionary themes. Our themes were, um, and I think the next slide will show that, we did one on the liberation movements that were going on called Forces of Victory. We had the Kingdoms of the Forest of Benin. Um, we had sculptures of Benin. We had Zapata, the Mexican revolutionary. So we always have revolutionary films, but we um, participate in Carnival as the Race Day Collective. So outside of producing the magazine, being activists um, and doing all the other things, we also have a mass camp, which we set up in what is now the Brixton Lido. And we go in there in the evenings and we start making our own uh, costumes for carnival and I mean there are hilarious stories around our costume making but that's that's for another day but we have a designer um, called Una House Darkus's first wife and she designs brilliant costumes for us and we had a wonderful carnival band and when we were on the road with Mangrove and with all our Trinidadian friends um, we you know we had a whale of a time. So you you won carnival three years in a row what years were yeah, those? Yeah for band of the year Gosh, I'm, I'm no, someone's going to have to help me here, or I'm going to look at a photo album here in a minute and see if I can get the dates. But I would think it's got to be 77, 78, 79, around that time. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. And this is one of your bands, I think. So this is one of the, this is a guy called Dr. Rat. His real name is Winston Bruce. He's one of the carnivalists who's come over from Trinidad. Mm. And we built a polystyrene tank over a car and he's going, this is him going down Ladbrook Grove, and the name of this band is Forces of Victory, and this is our way of celebrating the liberation movements in Mozambique, Angola, Guinea-Bissau, and Southern Africa. So, of course, the rifle isn't real, the tank isn't real, but I have to tell you, when we hit Ladbrook Grove and went down with that tank, people just gasped because it was so, so lifelike. And that's Doctor from East Dry River, Port of Spain, on top of the tank as we go down in, in, a, in our band called Forces of Victory. Amazing. OK, this is a picture of Marla Sen now. Um, who is Marla Sen and how did she link into Black Radical Politics and Race Day Collective. Okay, so Marla Sen is um, a member of the Race Today Collective. She, um, she was in the Black Panther movement and the Race Today Collective is an amalgamation of people who leave the Black Power movement. So Race Day Collective is made up of members of 
the Black Unity and Freedom Party, that's myself, Jean Ambrose, and somebody called Claudius. The Brixton Croydon Collective, that was Michael Goodet and Eden Charles. The Black Panther Movement, that's Dark as How, Barbara Breeze, Marla Sen, and Fruit Dondi. So Marla's been a member of the Black Panthers and joins the Race Today Collective. We get a telephone call one day in Race Today offices from some Asians in East London, and they'd simply say, we understand you help black people. And um, we said, yes. And they said, well, we, we have problems in the East London with housing and we believe we're being fiddled with our housing. Could you come and help? So Marla goes down to East London with Farouk um, because they're Asian. And what this is, is a mural that's been put up in honor of Marla because Marla has since passed, that was put up in East London by the mayor of London to honor Marla's struggle in support of the Bengali um, movement in East London, particularly on the issue of housing and against the racist attacks that were really, really prevalent in that period. Did you say the mayor of London or did you mean the mayor of Tower Hamlets? No, I'm the thinking... mayor, Sadiq Khan puts this. this oh, this okay. is part of the mayor of London. This is oh. a mural to Marla from the mayor of London. And Marla Sen, was she Bangladeshi? Was no, she's Indian? Indian. She's Indian. She's Indian. Okay. Well, I have a little video clip to explain something to do with um, the housing in the East End in the 1970s. So let's have a look at this and then you can comment a bit more after you've heard the, the, this two minute clip. For some people, it's something that they find um, but a, a little bit shameful. I think that for lots of people, there was this idea that you came to London and then you ended up squatting. No house for selling in this area, so where I have to be live? Once they find out that you are Asian, or African or something, they don't bother to give us a flat. They don't bother. That time I know already that if, if you squat, they can't throw you out. They have to take you to the court and all these things. was experienced because there was this inbuilt discrimination in the housing system. They took inspiration from some of the white squatter communities around them and began to squat and it grew into a much bigger movement as well. They were the ones who were at home, who were facing the conversation, whether it was with the council officials that would come to the door, whether it was the police that might come to the door or whether it's indeed the, the bricks and the rocks that were thrown through the windows. Rastar phone box ke phone hotam tar amra re mara door korto table korto jeto table korto amra anamati koro dukto ito kine amra jo mari lego. Exactly a week after the ghetto plan had filled the nation's newspapers and the Bengalis had become the focus of attention, they were the targets of a large and organised racial attack. I came to Whitechapel station around about eleven o'clock at night, Christmas Eve, and then the group came and one of them stabbed me with a knife. And I got hold of it. I have a big cut here. That's what always happens at night, especially at night. I was thinking to myself, hang on a minute, my granddad was in, London, in Tower Hamlets at the same time. Why do I not know anything about what he did? My nana, his friends, his cousins, they have to be poked and prodded and you just have to keep on digging until they kind of break down a sort of barrier that they've built, until they can speak about what they've been through. Although a lot has changed, there are still some similarities left. My family, there was 11 of us living in a two bedroom flat and for years they'd been bidding, what, asking the council for a home, nothing. And then my mum had enough. 
my mum then went and she was like this isn't right like and then it, I guess that's what the change is if you've got a voice now you can be heard had the Bengali squatters not taken this direct action it's really questionable about what would have happened to the Bengali community and I think that young people need to look back at this past history to look at the direct action that was taken and be able to draw on that experience and think about how do we use that those ideas that kind of commitment and how do we apply that to a very different but at the same time very similar landscape today Oh, any any comment on that? Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, so race today was, um, you know, I was down in the East End of London as part of that squatting movement. And as part of that squatting movement, we also formed the Anti-Racist Committee of East London and um, members of race today used to be on the patrols that patrolled that area at night because there was a lot of racist violence which you've you've heard about Altab Ali who was murdered in East London and big meetings held around that so we were active um, and, and again something I say to sort of young activists today is that we were in East London for three years it wasn't a campaign we went in worked with them and left we were in East London for three years and eventually the movement that we were part of all of these people got rehoused by the Greater London Council. They were successful in getting decent housing. But at the time, uh, the electricity was connected illegally. Um, the, the flats were just awful. But what stands out to me is when we were down there, and as it pointed out, there were, first of all, it was a very male-dominated community. And we said we had to protest to the council and that the, the women had to come. The, it was agreed that the women could join the march. And when we got to Tower Hamlets Council, these women who had never been on a demonstration in their lives, they just lay down on the steps of the council. And when the councillors came out and saw these women lying down on the steps that they had to climb over, they just said, well, what's going on? Um, and this was all around the direct action to get decent housing for the Bengali community in East London. Um, that is not something that's taught in schools. I can tell that for a fact. No, no not at all. No. I think that was one of the points that one was trying to make. Okay. Oops. So here we have a demonstration. This is in Bradford, I believe. Tell us a bit about, a bit about George Lindo and this demonstration. So sure. So George Lindo campaign, this is one of the big campaigns that we fight in Bradford um, and Leeds. Um, George Lindo was a working class man who liked to put a bet on. He used to like to go to the bookie. And one day when he was going to the betting shop, he was arrested by a police officer um, who said that he'd been involved in an armed robbery somewhere else. But if you knew George and you met George, you absolutely knew this was not true. Um, and so George, George Lindo, we formed the George Lindo Action Committee with the Bradford Black Collective. And, and members of Race Day, we used to travel to Leeds in our minivans, as, as we then did, to support the family and to support the people who wanted to take action because everybody knew that George was innocent. George was found guilty and George was sent to Armley Prison. Um, and we used to go to Leeds, so although he's from Bradford, he's sent to prison in Leeds and we used to go to Leeds and, and uh, demonstrate outside the prison. George is finally released and found not guilty when it's discovered that the police officer who's framed him has also been falsifying statements in the Yorkshire Ripper case. You remember the case of the Yorkshire Ripper who was raping women in Bradford? It's the same police officer who's falsifying statements in the Ripper case who's falsified a statement against George. So George is eventually released, but not before he's found guilty and sent to prison in Army Prison. Linton writes a poem about George Lindo, and this is one of the big um, campaigns that Race Today, the Black Parents Movement and the Black Youth Movement is involved in. And all the demonstrations are in the north of England. So we're traveling regularly to the north of England in order to support this campaign. Yeah, and that's about 200 miles. That's like four hours of driving at least to get Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. In, a mini, in minivans, we used to go, um, yeah. get drivers and drive up there. And then you're staying at someone's house on the floor, I suppose. Yeah, we're staying, yeah, we're staying with members of the Lindo family. The lady at the front who's holding this, this, the placard, George is innocent, that's George Lindo's mum. 
And then the lady who's got my husband suffers and so do I, that's Carol Lindo, George's wife. So these are campaigns where like the whole community is involved, families, friends of families, cousins, aunties. And so we, when we go up there, of course, we're staying with, um, with relatives, with friends, we're all being put up and, and looked after. This is police corruption in 1980s. I yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. you can still see- I think George might even be late 70s. I'd have to get the correct date. Um, I think Michael's on the call, so he can say the date. But this is, I mean, this is real, real police corruption. This this hmm. man had absolutely nothing to do with the armed robbery that he was convicted of and sent to prison for. Yeah. And it only comes to light because he's found falsifying statements in the Ripper case. And so George then gets released. And I suppose I should make the point that it wasn't just people like George Linda that went to prison for things they didn't do. There was a it was a regular thing for black people across the country. That oh, was absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Mm, okay. New Cross Fire and the resulting march called the Black People's Day of Action. You were involved in that as well, Lena. So tell yeah. us a bit about that. Yeah. Please. So um, I think now that that more people know about this, and again, it's due to BBC television, which again is something around our history not being told. And, and not being known because until recently, I've had all this history, but it's only in the last two years that people have even asked me about it. So this is all to do with, with, with the New Cross fire um, in 1981, where originally finally 13 young people perished it, some not immediately, some afterwards, um, Yvonne and, and Paul afterwards, a West Indian house party where there is a fire that um, kills 13 young people initially and then a year or so later when one of them commits suicide, we now say 14 people were victims of the New Cross fire. And of course the issue around the New Cross fire was at that time in Britain and British society, nobody but nobody was taking the matter seriously. Racist attacks weren't being taken seriously. Um, the demands, the fact that the police were corrupt wasn't being taken seriously. And the New Cross fire for many people in the black community was just a step too far. This now was where we thought, no, this has got to stop. And so this is why we have this huge mobilization um, done through a very democratic process. We set up something, again, this is where our politics come in. We, called, we had something which we called assemblies, people's assemblies, where anybody could come and give a point of view about how they thought the community should respond to this fire. Um, some of the, the views were that it was time to get guns and we needed to start arming ourselves and shooting some racists. Um, some were saying, you know, that there wasn't a solution at all that could be had in this country and that we now had to seriously consider whether we should, there should be big movements of people going back. Um, but one of the, uh, but someone got up and said, we ought to have a black strike and we ought to demonstrate on a working day. And that's how the Black People's Day of Action ends up on a Monday. And in order to make our presence felt, we said we were not going to do the traditional march of starting in a community, marching to Trafalgar Square, having some speeches on a Saturday or a Sunday, everybody goes home after the speeches. This wasn't going to be the case. This is one where we were going on the streets. We marched for eight hours through London um, to make our presence felt. Um, as, as people might know from the, from the films that have been seen, when we get to Blackfriars Bridge, even though the police have agreed that we can cross the bridge into central London, although I must say they um, re agreed reluctantly, always when we met with the police, the sticking point was Blackfriars. They did not want us to enter into the city of London and disrupt London, but we were adamant that this, this had to be for us. This was a turning point for us, that we were, go we were going to do it. So finally they agree. The strength of feeling was so high, I think the police knew that we would be marching anyway. But of course at Blackfriars, they tried to stop us. And that's when we break through the police barrier and do what we said we would do, which was go to the Houses of Parliament and finally end up in Hyde Park. Um, the numbers on the march, it's been 15 to 20,000 people. It's considered the largest political uh, mobilization of black people in this country. It was round an issue of 
black children being killed in Britain. It was a British issue that caused this demonstration. And as I've said, it was eight hours through the streets of London and the march swells as it moves on. So I think, you know, people who know about it know that people left their um, schools, they left their colleges. People would be on buses and look down and see us and would join the march. So the march swells as it's moving. As, as we're going along, the march is getting bigger and bigger. People are passing us who are shopping, see what we're marching for and just join the march with their shopping bags. I mean, it was a, a, a momentous day, a momentous day. And to be clear, when you plan the march, you use all your race to day connections and contacts across the country. And you weren't really expecting to have like even 5,000 people, I think, at the time. No, so Darkus um, learns from America. So Darkus had, had, had met civil rights leaders in America. And the, there was this thing called one in five. That what the civil rights movement said in America was that if you speak to one person, they will tell five other people. So Dark has traveled the length and breadth of Britain. I mean, that's what the film doesn't show that Steve McQueen has done for Uprising. He doesn't show the level of political organization that went into this march. It wasn't just a mass movement and people gathered and marched at all. This had huge political organization around it from the, um, the people's assemblies where we would gather each week to discuss what we should do, how we would support the families, how we would raise money to support the families to bury their children. That was another side of the, of the organization. And then the mobilization. So Darkus travels up and down the country. We've got connections already through Race Today. We, we know Gus John in Manchester. We know Courtney Laws in Bradford. We know Max Farah in Leeds. So we march, so we have connections. But I have to say the thing that was different about New Cross is that in a way it mobilized itself because in the headquarters of New Cross Massacre Action Committee, which were the offices of race today, we are receiving requests from colleges, from student unions, um, from community groups saying, could you send us a speaker because we would like to, to mobilize to come on this march. So th there's that side of it as well. Well, but I think when Darkus originally thought, he thought at most 10,000 people, five to 10,000 people, he mm. thought. But of course, on the day when the coaches start arriving from all over the country and as the march swells as we go on and the school kids all leave school and come and join us, it ends up much, much bigger than that. Um, right. And also when you guys go through Fleet Street, you have racial abuse from the newspaper people who are in Fleet Street at that time. Is that right? Yeah. So what I say to everybody is that you have to understand how race and black people are perceived in Britain to understand that you're on a demonstration which is protesting the murders of 13 young people, you know, from sort of 11 and 12 through to 18 years old. And when you march down Fleet Street, which is that time is where all the newspapers are housed, that people boo you, shout at you, throw banana skins at you and basically start catcalling you as you march through Fleet Street where the newspapers are. Journalists are booing and hissing at you because you're protesting the murder of 13 people in a fire. That shows you how, when people say things haven't changed, it shows you the extent to which things have changed, I believe, when you realize the atmosphere in which we had that demonstration um, and how it was received by journalists on newspapers because we were standing up for our rights and protesting murders. Right. And it's also true to say that until Steve McQueen's film came along, I don't think there's been a drama that dramatization and in, in the movie form about the New Cross fire and the New Cross um, Black People's Day of Action. Even though it happened like 30 years ago, there's not been a film properly about that until just this or last year. Right. So I think, you know, whatever people say, and a lot of people have said to me, they have to question why it takes Steve McQueen to make films for our radical history to be known. So that's not just for New Cross, that's about the mangrove. Um, and that's the other films that he's made. That until then, all this history has not been talked about, known about. Black history in Britain has talked about civil rights, um, Martin Luther King. Um, mm. People have talked maybe about some international history, but the history of 
Britain itself, of black people's presence and fight for, for justice and freedom and equal rights in Britain, that has not been publicized, published or, or discussed, except from the radical organizations that, that we've talked about. But it was almost like a forgotten history, you know, that, that radical movement and what we did and what we achieved until the McQueen films and the and BBC putting these films on about the Black Power movement. Um, most people who've come to me since those films have just said to me, we did not know. We mm -hmm. had no idea. We, we didn't know anything about this. Um, well, and that's been the biggest response that I've had. Yeah, well, I can tell you that we've been going about this for at least 20 years because right. all the, not all the films, but we, we actually had a whole season of films about the Black Pills Day of Action and the New Cross Fire at the BFI. When we do our walks and talks, it's always mentioned. Um, when we do the Not Hill what we reference, um, the Mangrove Nine. So there's been a whole bunch of, you know, um, local Black history or community groups that have been referenced in this history, but the mainstream have definitely ignored it for a very long time, up until yeah. fairly recently. But, Most definitely. And but, also the important thing that the white population, I mean, this isn't just black history. It's what we say. It's British history. Hmm. You know, this is not about black people only in Britain. This is this is British history and it should be taught as such. And of course, that's, it, that is exactly what hasn't happened. Well, some good news is here because um, there's a massive company called Tideway. They're building a super sewer tunnel from um, it's like 21 miles long to, to take all the sewage out of, of London. But basically, they have a site right next to Blackfriars Bridge. And we did some work with them on Black history in the Blackfriars area. And we have a suggestion that they recognize the significance of Blackfriars Bridge. And as a result of this um, suggestion they've taken on board, there are now these billboards on Blackfriars Bridge about the Black Fields Day of Action. So as you can see right there, there's several photographs, there's some words, there's some descriptions. So basically that history, on the bridge is recognized on the bridge with these billboards and these billboards will be, will be there for at least two to three years because they'll be there as long as the um, um the, the tunnel has to be built so they'll be there for a couple of years anybody who drives past that walk past that is going to see this history right there on these big billboards right on Blackfriars Bridge which has never been done before so that's that's a step forward in the right direction um and apart from that piece of recognition you also have our book. So we did the I did a book with Pearson, um, which is one of the big publishing companies in the world, uh, and they have a history GCSE history book, and that history book is partly based on our Notting Hill walk. So basically, they took our Notting Hill walk in or well, Notting Hill, and all the Black history in that walk is now in this GCSE textbook. So we're looking at Claudia Jones and Baron Baker and Frank Crichton, Darkest How and the Mangrove Nine. They're all in that book. In fact, we even meant include um, the Black Pills they have action as well. So let me show you an example of it. Here's a page from it, one page. And you can see that it says Frank Critchlow and the Mangrove Restaurant. And we go through the Black Panthers, um, Partner, Susu, Boxan, Carnival, Claudia Jones, Police Brutality. So for the first time ever at GCSE level, the history that we've been talking about, you know, some of the history we've been talking about at least, is now studied in schools across the country at GCSE level. And that's there now for ever and ever, amen, I should think. So that's some progress that's been made when it comes to education. It's fantastic, thank you. Oh. And this is you speaking at the venue that you used to kind of um, work out of? Yeah, this is the, the squat race today, of course, no longer a squat now, now housed. Um, although maybe not for long by the Brixton Vice Centre. But this event here is being held because there's an artist called John Daniels and he's commemorating um, the black, black people who've made a contribution to British society in Brixton. And he's done some artwork on the old offices of race today that include Olive Morris, Farouk Dundee, Darkus Howe, CLR James, um, somebody called Linton Quasi Johnson and Winifred Atwater. Atwood, uh, and um, in order to celebrate John's artwork, and unfortunately John also has, has uh, passed on, they hold an event and I just say a few words about what the what Race Today did in those offices and why what John did was important in commemorating that fact. And that's me just talking with the backdrop of Race Today covers. Okay. And here's a book which you have um, partly written, I think it says here, Leila Hassan. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, when Darkest died 
now almost five years ago in 2017, this was, we thought that we had to show what we had done um, in terms of race today and the and the collective and the work of the collective. And so Pluto Press agreed that they would publish an anthology of race today articles. And we published this and we were beginning to have I mean, we had an offer from America to tour the United States with this book, mm -hmm. as well as in Britain, we were setting up tours and COVID struck. And so we weren't ever able to launch the book in the way that we hoped to. Um, but that has changed, of course, because the McQueen documentaries and, and dramas have brought this whole period of history to life now. And this is now one of Pluto's best selling titles. Um, so we, we were very pleased to be able to do this. It's a small collective of us again. Um, uh, called, we call ourselves the Darkest Heart Legacy Collective. Uh, this is the, the first kind of main thing that we did, which was to publish the anthology. The photograph is of Darkest winning his appeal at the Royal Courts of Justice after he'd been sentenced to prison for three months. But we had a huge campaign to free Darkus and were able to free him um, after two weeks of his three months prison sentence. So that's why that's on the cover outside the Royal Courts of Justice. And this is a book that gives you an insight, just a small insight into the depth and the range of what Race Today did um, and, what, and what Race Today stood for. Yeah, I'm just looking because you see like the paragraph that begins from 73 to 88, race today. Um, the last line there mentions Walter Rodney. Then it says Bobby Sands. Wasn't Bobby Sands the Irish hunger yep. striker who died in yep. prison because he was on hunger strike? Yeah, so Bobby Sands, we had a connection with the Irish. The I, at that point, the IRA was also fighting to um, against the British. And I think those struggles you know, the struggles of the Irish against British rule in, in, in Northern Ireland are, are also now something that's been well documented. Bobby Sands was a member of the IRA who went on hunger strike Mrs. Th against Mrs. Thatcher and what they were, were doing in terms of recognising that there were issues with the Catholic community in Northern Ireland. And Bobby Sands wrote a short story. Um, and, and Jerry Adams, who is one of the politicians of Northern Ireland, who was one of the leaders of the radical movement in Northern Ireland, came to Race Today to visit us. And um, we always had connections with the Irish because we felt that their struggle, and they also said that they were fighting a colonial struggle against the British. So that was our connection. So we published a short story of Bobby Sands, but Bobby Sands in the end went on hunger strike and died on hunger strike. Um, and that is the kind of extent of the, the feeling of the Irish movement at that time. All right, cool. So as I mentioned before, this is just one of a series of events looking at Darkest Howell and Black Brit Civil Rights and his legacy. So tomorrow we have Leila Hassan Howe speaking about Darkest Howe. So today she's spoken about herself mostly, but today she's going to speak about, sorry, tomorrow she's going to speak about Darkest Howe in particular. That's another free event. You can access this online by going to Eventbrite and booking your free ticket. And you'll hear a lot more about, you know, Darkest Howe kind of behind the scenes, so to speak. That's taking place tomorrow, 6.30, get tickets online. Other than that, on the 5th of November, this Friday come in, we're showing a rare, very rare film actually from 1969, which sees, which shows Dark as Howe taking on the Met Police on television in 69 with regard to police brutality and police racism. So this is really kind of rare and un unusual stuff. And we'll be showing the film itself at the BFI physically in real life, so to speak. And you can come and check it out because after we've shown this film from 69 with Dark as Howe, we're gonna have a QA in uh, at the BFI. So that's a real life in-person event at the BFI. You can get your tickets from the BFI website, just tap in bfi.org.uk and come to see that because that's a really unusual, very rare film. And then on the 6th November, we have a whole day, a whole day of films about Dark as Howl from Black Power to Broadcasting. So we're looking at his early days as an activist right up to this stage when he was actually on TV on a regular basis pr promoting or sorry presenting various different um, documentaries and uh, investigative reporting. Amazing films that have not been shown on TV for 30 years or so. Have not been shown in cinemas either. So we're going to show some films from the 60s, from the 80s that have not been seen for 25, 30 years. Um, most of them feature Darkest Howl, but they also feature other Black activists from that period of time 
who will be also actually on stage. So some of the people who are alive when Darkness was around are still alive now, and they're going to be actually there in person on stage, taking us through the various um, films and talks and events that Darker Side was involved in. And then, of course, we've got a couple of um, Black History Walks coming up. We've got a Black History of Theatre Walk in the West End. We've got an event looking at Black, a real Black Wonder Woman and her art, looking at a Black conservator and what she does. we got Stan Lee and Marvel's Black History. This is all stuff you can find online. And connected to this event, we have an event looking at Black British civil rights behind the scenes, whereby we're looking at um, a number of different Black power civil rights groups that are based in London, going back to the 50s and right up to the 80s. We'll be looking at that online. You can check that out as well. But now we are finished with our official formal presentation. We'll now take some questions from the audience using the chat function. So if you have a question, you can type in the chat and we'll event, attempt to answer it. We've got about 50 minutes worth of question time. So if you've got a question, type into the chat and we'll attempt to answer it in this format using the chat function. All right, so let's see what we've got here. <clears throat> Someone says, what, uh, Emilio says, what advice do you have for young activists today? What advice do you have for young activists today? That's from Emilio. So Emilia, um, I'm asked this question a lot and I'm afraid my answer is probably going to disappoint you because I don't have advice for young activists today. I always say that I'm now 73 and when I was a young activist, if a 73 year old had tried to give me advice, I wouldn't have listened either. Um, and I say this because I am not active in the way that I was. I don't have the understanding of the different radical movements that are going on. Um, the analysis of, of society as it is today and what you should or shouldn't do, I don't participate in that. And so I don't really feel that I'm in a position to give advice to anybody. What I do say though, is that we did what we did. And if you can learn anything from what we did, or do you want any detail more of what we did and how we did it? Remember, we're operating in a time of no social media um, when economically things were very, very much different. Even social relationships and the way people organized is different. And because I'm not part of that now, then I don't really feel it's my place to give advice to people because it isn't something that I'm involved in now. Um, and so I, I don't really give advice as such, but I'm always happy to say what we did and maybe, you know, you can learn from what we did and how we did it. All right. People are saying you don't look 73. And apart from that, um, can you recommend any books on black women's history, civil rights, etc., for the UK? Any books on black history, civil rights for women? In the, well, there, there's Margaret Busby's huge anthology. Which, which contains, um, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, I, I can see it now, the big book. That contains a lot of writing by uh, young black women. But in terms of people, and again, that's something which has been pointed out to me, talking about their civil rights history written by women in Britain today. I think they're very few and far between. There's people, I think there are people who've written about their experience. There's Heart of the Race, which looks at black women in the, in the United Kingdom, that's by, Beverly Bryan and Stephanie Dadsey. And um, apart from that, I think it's more novels. It's more people's experiences of life in Britain. At the moment, we have quite a lot of literature on that, on that subject. Okay. Are you still in touch with the, your fellow activists from the 70s? Oh, most definitely, most definitely. Um, uh, I mean, some of the activists of the 70s are with me now in the in the Legacy Collective. So I see Farouk, Michael, Claude, we're in touch on, on a regular basis, weekly basis. Um, others who, um, Jean and other people who uh, are active in other things. Oh, no, most definitely. Yes, I do. We, we do. There's a group of us who are still in touch with each other. And actually, how do you spend your... Well, actually, sorry, do you have a leisure time now or are you always still activist and working? 
No, no, so I, I worked for three days a week for the NHS. I do some project work for the National Health Service. That's mainly because I live alone, as I tell everybody, you know, I'm a lonely widow. And so I get out of the house by doing some project work for the NHS. But I'm also active in the Darkest Hour Legacy Collective and the work we want to do around making sure Darkest's legacy and his life and what Race Today did is brought to a wider audience. So I'm kind of active in, in that as well. But um, I also try to go to a lot of kind of more cultural events that go. So I've recently saw Shimananda Ngozi Adichie at the Festival Hall. I went to see Bernard Evaristo at the Festival Hall. So I'm, I'm interested. I mean, Bernadette's book, Manifesto, that's a book that people should read who are interested in activism and her cultural activism in, in that period. So, and I, I, I like jazz, I listen to music. So, you know, I try to live, um, you know, a, a kind of a, a good life culturally and socially and have a granddaughter, so active with that. So I, I try to live an all round life, but I'm still active in terms of the work I'm doing around the legacy of Race Today and Dark as Hell. How, how would you define activism? How would you define activism then? So I think activism today is different from what activism was for myself in the 70s and 80s, which is why I don't give advice. Because activism today, social media plays a huge part in activism today. When we were around, there was no social media. It was a telephone and it was letters and it was going to see people. So, um, but for me, an activist, so when I say I'm active in the in Darkest Hour Collective, it's that we have some aims and objects and I dedicate some of my life to making sure those aims and objects go to a wider audience. But activism today, I think, is, is a lot different from the activism of my era, if I'm honest. OK, um, you mentioned some books. Have you got any uh, movies or documentaries about black history, black women's history that you would recommend or suggest any movies, documentaries that you'd say to ask people to say people, suggest people should watch to find out more about this history we're talking about here? So in Britain, it's difficult because I'm trying to think of, of some, I think I saw, so, but with the United States, I mean, I advise anybody, and she's not British, but anybody who's interested in black women and black politics and, and women in politics has to read Toni Morrison. She is a must. Her essays, Mouthful of Blood, um, which are, you know, extremely political, her novels, I mean, Toni Morrison to me is kind of, one of the, the, the semin is really seminal for me in understanding black women, their contribution to society, their background, why their experience is different from white women, why their experience is different from black men and, and, and the struggles they've waged both personally and politically. Toni Morrison is the person I always turn to for that, I have to say. All right, so this weekend we're showing a number of different um, films about Mr. Howe and our sport yourself as well. Any Anything you're looking forward to in particular from the kind of agenda you've seen for um, Friday evening or Saturday the whole day? Anything you're looking forward to in particular? Yeah, so, so Calls for Concern, the one on Friday, I mean, it's amazing to see that as far back as that, this is the beginning of Darkest, um, the person who's challenging authority. Anybody who knows anything about Darkest is that he was tremendously courageous in that he never ever conceded or tried to mediate that the issue of black people and how they were treated had to change in Britain. And you see him very young. I mean, he's speaking, he, you know, Darkest trained as a lawyer in Middle Temple, but then stopped to be a, a radical activist. But you begin, you see that lawyer side of him. So I, I enjoy seeing the Calls for Concern film. But the other films that I'm looking forward to is that Devil's Advocate, um, where he is presenting and where he, he's challenging, sometimes humorously, sometimes not. And then Bandung the documentaries, because in talking to the BFI about what they should show and why, we're realizing how groundbreaking his television work is and was. And the fact again, that there isn't anything on television like it now. No, but he's not imitating white programs and putting a black face there and calling it progress. These are original programs, original takes. Um, he's looking at, you know, he has a conversation with the President Nureri of Tanzania. He's absolutely saying the black experience is paramount to all my program making. And that's what he's showing. And that was completely groundbreaking at that time. And even today is groundbreaking because you just do not see that on television now. 
Are you writing a book yourself? Um, I, some people think you should write a book right away, immediately. Um, are you doing, is that something you're considering? So no, this has been put to me by, you know, I've even had publishers as well saying that I need to write my story um, or get somebody to write my story. So it is something I'm seriously considering, but I haven't started to write my book yet, no. Okay. Let's see now, I've got a couple more questions we have to kind of wind up here now. Uh, oh, someone's asking if they can write an article on this talk. Of course you can. So, so Faith, yes, if you want to write an article on this, there's no problem at all. As I said before, this, this is being recorded. It'll be on our uh, YouTube channel in about three, four days or so. So all you got to do is check out, well, actually just go to our website. Our website is, let me put it in the chat, blackhistorywalks.co.uk. If you go there, you can see all coming events, and you'll also see a link to our YouTube channel, which is where this talk will, will be um, uploaded in a couple of days or so, and you can re-watch it and take notes and all the rest of it. It's right there for you to access. But at this point, I'm going to say to our special guest, Lil Hassan Hal, thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for the opportunity, and thank you for all those who joined to listen to me. No problem. People are saying fantastic, wonderful, love to hear you speak, very informative, best two hours I've ever spent. Yeah, legend. You're, thank you. So you can see what's coming up there, right? They're all saying thank you. So, um, well, yeah, if you, if you thought this was good, come tomorrow because there'll be more tomorrow. We couldn't, we couldn't include all the stuff in this two hours or so, but if you come tomorrow, you'll hear even more information about um, Darker Sam himself. And of course, we'll have the films on Friday and on Saturday. So if you're in London, come down. The tickets are like I don't know, six pound fifty, whatever. Um, so no excuse not to come down and check out this stuff face to face. Plus, on stage you're gonna have um, well, Leila will be there. Plus, Fruit Donny will be there. Plus, there'll be some other activists from uh, that seventies era on stage, keep telling their uh, tell their telling their stories as well. Plus, some younger generation as well. So please check it out. Come down uh, if you can on Friday and Saturday, and log in tomorrow for these part two of this talk, looking at Darker Side himself in particular. Other than that, thank you very much and goodbye. Goodbye, Tony, thank you. Bye everybody.